day to, to give a presentation in this colloquium and very happy that she did. And um, yes, she will report on her prior, recent and current work on predictive maintenance and we're very happy to um, hear the results. So Sarah, please go ahead. Thank you, Nils. Um, so I will be talking about uh, decision support methods for infrastructure maintenance. And I will be uh, reporting of uh, most of the research for, that I did in my PhD and uh, some um, research that I did as a part of Primavera in last uh, eight to nine months. Here you see University of Twente because I will be talking about my PhD research that I did in my University of Twente. I hope uh, most of you uh, know me, but uh, in any case, uh, brief introduction about uh, me. Uh, I did my master's in information system from uh, University of Twente. Uh, I graduated in 2015. I then started the PhD in uh, infrastructure management or information management from construction management and engineering, again from University of Twente. And uh, from last uh, eight to nine months, I'm working uh, in Red Bull University in software sciences department uh, within Primavera project. And uh, I'm happy to share that uh, uh, from the next year on, I will be working as assistant professor at Information System Group in uh, TUE Eindhoven. I guess the idea is that if any of you have questions, then maybe we could communicate during uh, the, the presentation instead of leaving uh, them at the end. Then it's more interactive, I guess. So I have been involved in a number of projects, uh, as uh, could be seen with the icons that most of them were related to the transport infrastructure uh, about rails and uh, road bridges. Uh, so I was actually hired on a, a destination rail project, which was, which was a project about uh, railway infrastructure. And uh, the idea of destination rail was that how we could actually uh, develop a uh, a decision support tool to help uh, in making the maintenance decision for uh, railway infrastructure managers. It was a Horizon 2020 project. And during my uh, PhD, I also got involved in cost action, TU 1406. And the idea of this project was uh, to develop a standard quality specification document for uh, uh, European bridges. And in this project, it was a very large uh, consortium. And I guess from each country, there was some representative from the road uh, agencies. So it was very uh, nice project. And I also get to network with a lot of people from many countries across the Europe. Uh, other project that I also initiated during my PhD, in which uh, YAP uh, kindly agreed to host me at uh, Raiswadastad. I worked on this project for eight to nine months, and where I looked into the bridge uh, intervention prediction, and I looked into the visual inspection data and how I could we could actually develop uh, some machine learning models and help them make the decision about the assessment of condition state and risk indexes and maintenance intervention uh, planning. And last but not least, uh, at the moment I'm involved in the Primavera project. So this all, uh, these, all these projects have a main theme and that is something about uh, uh, maintenance that I will be focusing on today as well. Uh, about uh, the content of this uh, presentation, I will be uh, starting with uh, some introduction. So I guess it's a good idea to uh, start by saying that what is productive maintenance uh, in my understanding? Um, how do an ideal productive maintenance system looks like? Probably what are the challenges in adopting such a system for industry and for say road or railway agencies? And what are the specific challenges for the infrastructure uh, maintenance? Then I will briefly talk about the decision support methods that I have developed during my PhD. And uh, afterwards I will talk about two specific cases. So one case is from railway switches, where I will talk about the productive maintenance of these railway switches and afterwards, I will talk about uh, uh, developing a machine learning uh, method for the automatic damage detection of the bridges using the uh, visual data. And that fourth part is specifically what I did during uh, within Primavera. So I guess this is the figure. If you have seen the Primavera uh, proposal, this is a figure that you must be uh, that you would have seen. So uh, here I introduce the maintenance policy. So starting on the preventive uh, maintenance and here the idea is that some maintenance is uh, performed uh, on a uh, planned basis. So after each interval uh, maintenance is performed, but the problem here is that if you see it on the scale of time and event criticality, the problem here is that uh, in planned maintenance or in preventive maintenance, we end up uh, doing uh, 
maintenance too often. So probably once we are doing this maintenance, we are not actually using the whole functional life of our structure that must be used. So in that sense, we end up uh, spending more cost as compared uh, to harvesting more benefit from a structure or a system. On another extreme, we see uh, corrective maintenance, where maintenance is only performed uh, once the system has a breakdown. And this sort of uh, maintenance, probably we end up using all the functional life of a machine or a system, but uh, this leads to a lot of problem in resource management and unavailability of system and uh, depending on a system, maybe unhappy users or customers. In between, we see a condition-based maintenance, and here the idea is that some sort of inspection is performed. We assess the condition of a structure and then decide that should maintenance be performed or can it be delayed. Uh, but what happened in condition-based maintenance is still we are not really looking in the future or not really predicting it. And this is where the predictive maintenance comes in, that even if we are collecting the data using condition-based maintenance, how we could actually use this data and do predictive modeling where we could actually predict that what is the possible failure or we could, for example, answer the question that how likely a system will fail in say X number of months. And this is the idea with the predictive maintenance. So to uh, see that how does an ideal productive maintenance uh, system uh, looks like. So for example, uh, imagine that we have uh, some structure and the, that structure will have multiple uh, sensors on it. This sensor could be about uh, temperature sensor, inclinometer sensor, accelerometer sensor that is giving us different information uh, about the structure. And we are collecting uh, these uh, data from uh, this sensor monitoring. So this is the ACID monitoring part. Uh, the next step is about the performance assessment. So actually here it uh, it means that how do we make sense of the data that we have collected uh, using these sensors. So what, what is actually these sensor values are telling us about the structural health of these structure of our, our system. So after understanding that what do we, this mean by uh, sensors, we could actually do some predictive modeling and this really involves what sort of data we have. So for example, we could do uh, time series analysis, some regression analysis and see that can we predict uh, failure in the future instead of doing some planned maintenance or uh, corrective maintenance. And if you could already uh, predict such things, we can very well in time uh, plan our maintenance in a way that is uh, most cost effective and uh, maybe uh, most uh, effective in a way that we end up uh, introducing least uh, unavailability um, aspect to the uh, network. So just to summarize the whole idea of a predictive uh, system is that uh, we want our structures that are, say, for example, self-diagnostic, that uh, it can issue an alert within a time even before uh, they are about to fail. Uh, so before I uh, go and represent what uh, I did, uh, I wanted to look, uh, I, I wanted to share that how do productive maintenance uh, looks like in practice. So this is a survey that I am sharing from a PwC uh, survey report. And it showed, it uh, surveyed uh, 280 companies from Netherlands, Belgium, and uh, uh, Germany. And they try to uh, ask, and these companies are from multiple industries. So they are road, railway, aviation, and the manufacturing domain as well. And they are assessing that at which level of uh, productive maintenance maturity level companies are. So for example, here we can see that only 11% of the companies are actually implementing predictive maintenance and uh, more than uh, two thirds of are below uh, the level of real time monitoring. So what happened is that they assess the condition state of structure using some instrument and uh, uh, then there is no real-time monitoring or there is a no predictive aspect for these maintenance. So this is what uh, what is a typical uh, situation when we are assessing it. So there is some visual inspection and then based on expert opinion or experience, the decision related to maintenance uh, are made. Uh, if we look into the literature, uh, this is a uh, sort of similar results uh, that we see. So uh, on the first bullet, I'm sharing uh, the result from, from a paper that uh, the, the student of actually Tido and Jan did. He uh, interviewed four companies, I guess from Netherlands, uh, where he asked questions that uh, what are the limitations in adoption of productive maintenance or how do they actually make this decision for maintenance? 
and they conclude that there is actually a gap between the potential and uh, realized benefit of uh, productive maintenance. And this could be because uh, there is a uh, little less understanding on how to actually use this um, analytics that we do from the data or what sort of features to measure once, for example, we start to do the real-time monitoring or uh, uh, continuous monitoring of uh, structure. Similar results uh, I see from the other paper that uh, almost even though we are collecting a lot of data and this data doesn't have to be a real-time monitoring or instrument inspection, even if it is a visual inspection data, around 70% of this collected uh, data about acid management is, is never used in practice for any decision making. And if we talk specifically about the uh, infrastructure and transport infrastructure, then it is also not actually practically feasible that we do this continuously continuous monitoring on a geographically distributed assets that we actually do the uh, structure health monitoring by wanting sensor on multiple of these uh, structures. Other two aspects uh, of that actually limit uh, the adaptability of productive maintenance in practice is that there is no standard metrics for industries or companies to actually estimate that what are what is the return on investment if they go on and adapt uh, such a system. And other than uh, that, sometimes the model, the data-driven model that we develop using machine learning for productive maintenance, they are in a black box nature and it is hard for infrastructure manager to actually make sense and understand such a model and say, and to communicate that why the model is making the decision uh, and what are the reasoning behind it. And I guess this is the reason that the, there are the projects like Primavera, which try to actually combine physics-based model and data-driven models. So our results that we present to industry and infrastructure managers are much more interpretable and uh, transparent. Uh, so starting from the specifically for uh, infrastructure maintenance and what are the challenges for uh, maintenance decision making. Here I'm trying to show that uh, on the uh, on the map of Netherlands that there are multiple assets that uh, need some sort of uh, maintenance, but there are multiple factors that actually make uh, these maintenance decision making uh, very challenging. So, for example, there is uh, uh, limited funding. Uh, so we know that since the economic crisis of 2008 there is a limited funding to spend on the infrastructure. And because of this reason, there is a increasing backlog of the, of the maintenance. So it's like we have a budget constraints and at the same time, we have uh, assets that are uh, aging. They mostly have the age of 70 or 80 plus. And we also have an environment uh, impact. So for example, there is an increasing rain, there is an increased temperature, which all impact uh, our structure. Also, there is an increasing traffic intensity and maybe our uh, structures are being used uh, in a way that they were never designed for. So these are all the aspects that need to be considered when making these uh, maintenance decisions. Also from the uh, government, there are some service level agreements that the infrastructure managers has to comply with. So they are about uh, traffic safety while you're doing maintenance or the impact on environment uh, in, in sense of maintenance and uh, also uh, the availability demands. So if you look into the, the typical uh, decision making scenario, then most of the time these decisions are based on expert judgment, which is uh, great. But the problem with this uh, uh, procedure is that uh, these decisions sometimes become very hard to follow. So they are, uh, they are means for example, if you try to look back and see that why this particular decision was made uh, to do the maintenance of bridge X, not Y, then it becomes very difficult to uh, understand that why certain decisions is, was made based on uh, what uh, properties or what uh, reasons. This is uh, uh, the, the other top point that I already mentioned is that in inaccessible data. So if you look into the road or railway agencies, most of the time there are multiple systems and these systems are very structure specific. So we have, for example, bridge management system or pavement management systems. So here uh, it becomes difficult if you're talking about the maintenance planning or at a network level, while you want to consider multiple assets, then it is itself is difficult to uh, actually get your hands uh, on with the data of multiple assets. So all of these factors come together, which make the maintenance decision making a very uh, difficult and challenging task. And imagine that infrastructure manager actually have to answer, considering all these impacts, uh, factors, infrastructure manager has to answer the question like which maintenance shall be performed, when should the maintenance be performed, and uh, uh, where shall we spend our budget, and what is the best time to do the maintenance, how much the maintenance will cost, and what if the maintenance is being delayed. So it is 
beyond the cognitive capacity of a person to actually consider all of these factors and uh, still come up with the cost effective uh, maintenance plans. So that actually made uh, the objective of my uh, research that I did, including Primavera in last uh, five years. And the idea was that how we could actually aid transport infrastructure manager in decision making process of maintenance planning. And there we, I tried to develop applied decision support methods and uh, predictive models. Uh, here I will try to um, explain the, the work that I did, but very briefly uh, within single line, and then I will go to the specific case of railway switches and uh, automated damage reduction of uh, bridges. So actually we uh, start by looking into the different methods of uh, multi-criteria uh, decision analysis. And the, the reason for this was that we wanted to come up with a method where the maintenance decisions are made not only on the cost aspect or not only on the reliability aspect of structure, but we could also consider, for example, the availability aspect or the environmental uh, environmental impact aspect. So there are multiple methods of multi-criteria decision analysis, and we wanted to see that which method is most suitable while we are trying to apply it for the uh, maintenance planning uh, scenario. So we uh, evaluate different methods uh, based on their ease of use, their scalability, if they are able to consider uh, the preferences of decision maker, and shall we do we need to convert these uh, um, attributes into some standard scale and then we come up with a single method that we actually apply to a network-wide maintenance planning uh, problem. And here we uh, go with the network-wide maintenance planning because typically if we look into the literature then uh, the maintenance planning is done on the object level. So um, by this, I mean that we are looking, we are doing the in-depth uh, study for a single bridge. And the idea here is to come up with the, say, which is the most optimal maintenance uh, intervention to do. So do nothing, replace it, maintain it, do the minor intervention. But instead of staying only on object level, our idea was that we want to consider that what if, that how to make maintenance decision if you're trying to consider the multiple assets and each of these assets have their certain condition state, had certain uh, have, will require certain maintenance cost, will have certain impact on the availability and the environment uh, impact. So using the multi-attribute utility theory, we generate the prioritization of these assets and while we were trying to satisfy all the performance requirements. The good thing about uh, uh, using this multi-criteria decision analysis method was that we were not really uh, making the decision looking only on data, but we could actually consider the preferences of uh, decision maker or infrastructure manager. And then he have a say to say that if the cost is the most important factor here or the reliability of uh, environment, uh, reliability of a structure is most important or the availability of the network is the most important uh, factor. Uh, so once uh, we developed uh, this network wide maintenance plan, this uh, model was able to answer us that uh, which assets need maintenance, but it was still limited and could not answer us that when is the most optimal type of man when is the most optimal time to do the maintenance. And also this uh, the model that we develop here for the prioritization of network wide asset, it was not telling us that how we could actually do the maintenance while we have uh, budget constraints. So that's why uh, we uh, try to extend this model into making a multi-year maintenance planning framework. And what this framework actually do, it, it takes all the assets that are on the network and it try to uh, come up uh, with the plan of next five years that given the budget limit, how we could actually try to allocate maintenance to maximum of these uh, uh, assets uh, given that the average uh, uh, reliability level of, uh, of the network could be increased. And we use different tools for that. So for example, to come to imagine that how the condition of a structure is going to deteriorate over the time, we apply discrete uh, Marco decision processes. And here we wanted to be uh, looked into the last two inspection of a, a structure. And we see that how the condition state of a structure is uh, uh, deteriorating over time if no maintenance is uh, performed. Then we model this uh, problem into the genetic algorithm where we could actually um, apply this uh, multi-objective uh, uh, computerial optimization where we are trying to um, decrease the maintenance uh, cost or staying within a budget limit and still having a maximum, uh, have, maximizing the reliability of the network. 
so these, these uh, the, the topics that I'm discussing are were all the uh, chapters in my uh, PhD. So afterwards, I looked into the productive modeling of uh, maintenance, and this is what I'm going to explain in uh, detail. So here, our idea was that uh, how we could uh, uh, predict or identify the maintenance need or type of a railway switches. And here I work with the Irish railways, and uh, uh, this was uh, their uh, business case. So at the moment uh, in Irish Railway, or I guess it's also the case with uh, a lot of railway switches in NS that uh, they don't do the uh, continuous uh, monitoring of the switches. So most of the time there are legal inspections that are done to make sure that the railway switches are uh, working uh, properly. So what happened uh, there is that after uh, there are different sort of inspections. So there are planned inspection and sometimes there are uh, um, they say that they are the patrolling guys who do uh, this inspection of these uh, railway switches to make sure that they are working fine. And if they see that something is not uh, working well or they suspect that uh, some sort of maintenance need to be done, they come back and they create a notification in their SAP system. And with this notification, they provide uh, detail of like what is the problematic uh, uh, element of this uh, point and crossing and what is the specific problem and uh, what could be the cause of this problem. Uh, what the, Once they collect these uh, notifications, there is a, a maintenance team who sit down and then decide that uh, uh, is, it a, is it a false alarm or shall we do something about it? And once they say that, okay, uh, this is a true alarm, say, and then we some maintenance has to be done, they create a work order for it, and then they decide that which sort of maintenance treatment should be performed here, and then they uh, ass assign it to a maintenance plan, and some maintenance is performed. And if, say, that they say that no maintenance should be performed, then they assign uh, some some other status to it, say that maybe we should do the additional uh, condition monitoring and be, make sure that if something is really wrong or it can go on uh, without any intervention. So what happened here is that uh, most of these decisions are made for case by case basis. So for each notification, they try to uh, make the decision uh, for uh, they try to make the decision of shall the maintenance be performed or what type of maintenance or uh, what could be the uh, the further action there. What we wanted to help here is that instead of doing it uh, on case by case basis, what if we could actually use the data that has been generated for quite some years and instead of uh, only making the decision for e each switch, we could there is a machine learning model that could help us and say that given by looking in, in the, the past uh, uh, information that I have seen about these problem and causes of the problem. And last time when you had this similar problem, this was the most probable uh, decision that was taken. So this is what we try to do. So we uh, look into the data that they had about the asset register. So this is the data about railway switches. So when it was uh, um, constructed, where is the location of the uh, switch? What is its condition state? So they also maintain some uh, uh, scorecard uh, to um, maintain the condition of a uh, switch. And there is a data about the notification and work order. So notification create uh, contains all of these uh, data about uh, uh, what about the possible problem on the switch and the work order contain all the maintenance that has to be done on the uh, network. And since we were uh, planning to treat this problem as a classification problem, uh, we create the data label. So on all the notifications that has some associated work order, we uh, considered that the, some maintenance was performed as a result. And all those that had no uh, work order related uh, associated, we considered that no maintenance was performed and that was actually a false alarm um, issued by the inspector guys. We looked into the different uh, modeling uh, techniques to see that which uh, modeling technique would uh, work uh, very well in this uh, scenario. So we looked into the uh, decision tree and here the idea is that we actually make a single tree from all the data that we have. Or we look into the random forest where we make uh, multiple, uh, using the subset of the data, we make generate multiple trees and uh, based on the majority vote, the one with the highest vote, uh, the class with highest vote is selected. And then we also look into the gradient boosting where the trees are made in a sequential uh, order and then there is a weighted average 
uh, to decide the most uh, related class. To evaluate that if our model is uh, performing uh, well, if we could actually predict such maintenance need or uh, maintenance type, uh, we use the typical approaches that are used in uh, machine learning. So using 70% of the data for training and 30% for the test or the cross validation where we iteratively use the data for training and uh, testing. Here, if we look into the uh, results uh, of uh, uh, maintenance uh, need prediction with the cross validation, we show that which met, uh, model did the best. So in our case, gradient boosting trees actually did the best. So it tell us with 92% accuracy or around 75% COPPA score that uh, shall we do the maintenance or uh, not do the maintenance if it is given with the new information about the notification uh, that is generated. Uh, similarly, for our maintenance uh, type prediction, we see that the random uh, forest uh, gave us around 78% of the accuracy. What was interesting for um, domain expert was to actually see that how the model is making decision and which attributes it is actually paying uh, most attention to. Uh, the, the general idea or the perception is that actually the problem cause and problem reason and detected problem should be the reason uh, on the basis of which uh, the decision of maintenance or maintenance type should be done. But here, if we look into the maintenance need, then the most uh, important factors that are driving these decisions are actually the location of the switch and the age of the switch, uh, which, uh, and th that is, that we, that is what we get in the data. So that also shows that in the past, the decisions that were made were not really actually considering the problem that was reported uh, during the inspection, but it was more of like the location. And it could be the reason that maybe there are switches at particular location that are being used much more as compared to a switch that is not uh, used um, that much. And they are the main reason to decide that how often uh, they are being uh, maintained. So this was the result that uh, uh, we shared uh, with the Irish Rail, and this was a good overall analysis for them to look into that how our model is, uh, is showing that which uh, features are most relevant for making a particular uh, decision. So I also uh, work with uh, Rice Watastad. Here I'm uh, deeply explaining uh, what I did for uh, prediction of condition index, risk level, and the maintenance intervention. And in the first one, I mostly looked into the tree-based model, but uh, uh, the data that we had uh, most of the time at the agencies are of structured nature. So it is uh, cate categories and uh, instead of... Uh, so in general, when we are working with the, the sensor data, they are of numeric nature or the, we have for, but for the maintenance, we mostly have this uh, structured data that are in categories. So we looked into the neural network. Instead of doing one hot encoding, we actually develop the entity embeddings of uh, neural network for the prediction. Uh, this is a whole paper that is uh, published. I will not go much more in detail than this. Uh, moving to the next. Uh, for those who have already uh, listened to what I did for transfer learning would be a bit of repetitive, but I have updated the slides to still uh, keep it uh, interesting. So our idea here is that uh, we wanted to uh, develop a transfer we wanted to uh, develop a method for automated damage detection using uh, the visual uh, data. And our motivation is that uh, for the several bridges, the visual inspection is performed and this visual inspection create uh, a lot of uh, images. And what happened with these uh, images is that uh, someone has to actually do the manual uh, damage identification of uh, these images to make a report for say um, inspection. But the, for the manual uh, damage uh, identification, it requires a lot of uh, effort and it requires uh, uh, domain knowledge. And it is likely that uh, one inspector is uh, going to uh, identify that damages on an image different as compared to another one. 
what we want is that instead, uh, if, for example, we could actually use some uh, drones and we could fly them around over a bridge or any structure, and that could actually do uh, the automated damage detection. It could show us that where are uh, the specific uh, uh, damages on a structure, like here uh, we see. But for example, in the case of roads, it's pretty straightforward because most of, of the time we have either portholes or the cracks on the roads. But once we are talking about uh, probably bridges, then the cracks could the the defects could be uh, much more sophisticated in sense of uh, spelling of incense or exposed uh, bars and other types. So what happens in the in the literature is that uh, instead of using these large uh, visual data set and having them labeled, the idea is that uh, most of the studies use a very small uh, uh, data set, like for example, these studies uh, I'm referring, and uh, they use uh, these data for the damage detection. We want to see that how we could actually uh, use transfer learning for uh, dam automated uh, damage uh, detection. And what do I mean uh, by this? Um, it, it is a little bit going back and explaining that what is uh, transfer learning. So what happened in our traditional machine learning is uh, that we, we sort of learn every time from the scratch. So uh, this is very uh, counterintuitive uh, for us, uh, for humans. Uh, it's like whenever we have a new data set. So for example, we are doing visual inspection. So we have a new data set, say from uh, Netherlands, and we are using uh, these data set of bridges and we are trying to develop a model for the prediction. We are not really using any of the knowledge or any of the visual data that was collected, say, for another uh, country. What uh, transfer learning suggests is that what if we could actually uh, use the knowledge that we have learned from one bigger data set, we fine tune this knowledge and then use it for our specific task. And it could be uh, exactly for the damage detection on, on, the, on the bridges. And this is much more uh, um, aligned with how we humans learn. So we don't learn everything from the scratch, but we actually try, uh, we have a general understanding of things and then we try to adapt or um, learn more uh, um, on these whenever we have we are encountered with the, with the new problem. And this is exactly what we want to see with our, uh, with this uh, damage detection with visual data that if we could actually use the transfer learning for that. There are uh, multiple approaches uh, to apply transfer learning in this uh, regard. So for example, there is a cross-domain transfer learning where we could use the data uh, from a, a unrelated domain. And here we are referring to an ImageNet. An ImageNet is a data set uh, having millions of images. And these images are not related to a, a visual inspection of bridges. These images contains day-to-day -day objects. While what it, uh, and then we can actually fine tune data for our uh, damage uh, detection task. Another approach could be that we actually use uh, one visual inspection data set and then use them for the, and uh, adapt them for our specific data set and use it uh, for the prediction. Another approach is that what if we use the combination of these and then adapt them for the specific uh, damage detection uh, task. So the objective for uh, this work was that we wanted to see that if uh, transfer learning is suitable for structural damage uh, detection or specifically is, is one of these approaches better than another or the combination of both of these is better than the uh, other one. This is what we wanted to find out. And uh, for this, uh, we looked into, uh, we make use of uh, six publicly available uh, bridge uh, damage detection data set. We are the first four were mostly about the crack and no crack uh, classes, while the other two were reporting uh, much more different types of uh, uh, defects on the, on the bridge structure. So here we wanted to see that uh, is it better to uh, not use this transfer learning at all, or is it better to use some sort of transfer learning to for the automated uh, damage detection? Here the results uh, these uh, here the results shows that which of the architecture is uh, doing uh, well. So for example, these. Um, so these are actually ordered in a way of the sophistication. So these uh, smaller architecture are also performing much uh, better as compared to uh, architecture which are much more complicated in sense of uh, machine learning. Here we are trying to show that which uh, 
So here we are using these uh, genetic data set for the adaptation of our uh, machine learning uh, model. And we are showing that which architecture is uh, doing well. Uh, this uh, graph uh, shows that what if we don't actually use the whole uh, data set, but instead we use only the percentage of that data set. So for example, uh, for this one of the data set, we did not use the 100% of it, but we only use the 20% of this data set. And then we see that which of the approach that I introduced previously is doing uh, better as compared to another. So the, the message here is that uh, we show that the combination of in-domain and ImageNet uh, uh, even with the 20% data show much better performance as compared to using only ImageNet or only in-domain uh, um, representations. And this holds true for most of our uh, data set. And we tried it with the six different data sets. Well, again, uh, what is more interesting to communicate to the domain expert is that we could actually show that uh, how the model is making decision and actually which part of the image our model is paying attention to to make a particular uh, decision. So we look into the gradient class activation mapping and then we try to develop such visual explanation of these models. And here we try to show that when if a model is uh, predicting that this uh, structure is potentially unhealthy, then which part of the image the structure is actually paying attention attention to. So the warmer colors are actually showing that which parts are playing most important role in uh, predicting a specific uh, class. And here it also ensures that our model is actually looking at the right part of the image to make the correct decisions. So this uh, leads me to the end of my uh, talk. Um, I want to share some conclusions and some lesson learned. So in sense of conclusion, uh, the machine learning and the, the multi-criteria decision analysis methods that I have uh, worked on, I see it, they are much more uh, consistent and explicit and uh, uh, data-driven in a way that it, they enable us to use the data that is already available at the agencies instead of collecting uh, new data and um, not considering the preferences of uh, decision maker. It also supports in subjective analysis of uh, experts. So here the experts could actually give their subjective uh, preferences. The methods that I have developed, they enable uh, the accommodation of multiple performance objectives, uh, by which I mean all the different aspects and different performance indicators relating to reliability, availability, and uh, uh, economic expect. It also enabled the budget estimation and optimization. Uh, and uh, we show that how we could actually use the effective, uh, how could we use the available data effectively. What I learned from the uh, using the real data for doing such these uh, predictive modeling is that uh, instead of uh, Collecting new data, it's always wise, of course, to start with the available data. It means even if that we say that we want to do the condition monitoring and we want to have a data that is uh, um, uh, that is telling the real state of a condition, and we don't want to use the data that is collected by some subjective assessment, but it is still always useful to start by looking into that what sort of data uh, is available because maybe we could actually use the data and develop some models that could directly be used by the uh, experts and they could uh, be streamlined in their uh, decision processes or business processes. And here we, we also need to make sure that the data that we are using could actually answer the question. Sometimes uh, I come across the, the uh, data that I'm trying to answer some sort of questions uh, with this data, but it is really not possible to use this data for that. So for example, if I'm trying to, um, I don't know, predict the condition state of a, a structure, but I don't have any past rela data related to this, then it is not possible to use this data for such a problem. Uh, another uh, lesson is that to understand the problem domain and analyzing uh, the data is most important uh, po uh, point. And I guess these uh, lessons are most what I try to remind myself during uh, when I did these. So in generally, the most uh, attractive part is to do this predictive modeling and using machine learning uh, models. But if we don't understand the problem domain and we don't understand what data is trying to communicate us, then modeling them will not be uh, sufficient. 
uh, also for this is very difficult for the machine learning models that how we could actually think about the evolving nature of the data. So what if a new damage class is uh, introduced or what if uh, there are new classes that are introduced and the, the data is changing uh, uh, over the time. And last aspect that uh, the um, most of the papers that I have wrote so far, uh, I always include the uh, interpretability aspect in, in the paper, uh, which shows that how even if we propose a very sophisticated machine learning model, but how actually a domain expert or how it could be applied in the practice. So interpretability is important for its adaptation. That's all for my presentation. If you have any questions, I will be very happy to answer or you can write me. Okay, so um, thanks a lot, Sahara. I would now start a virtual clap, but this is always a bit, um, a bit silly. Yeah. This was a very nice talk. There was one question in the chat by Hans Onfle, um, right at the beginning, did the machine learning model actually work? Besides that, you did not like it. I'm not very exactly sure to which this refers. Perhaps Hans can um, clarify. I, yes, in the beginning of your presentation, um, thank you for the presentation, by the way. Uh, you mentioned different methods and you said oh, we used machine learning, but uh, that um, the engineers did want to know why. Yes? Uh, that goes back to the explanation side. Yeah. But later I see that you actually made them and they worked. So my question is more like, so now in the end, did they, uh, so I, I'm now a bit confused about did you use them or not use them? I actually uh, did use them. The, the idea here is that uh, most of the time I have talked with uh, a lot of road and uh, railway infrastructure managers. And if we say that uh, there is a model that says that uh, don't do the maintenance, but if we don't tell them that why model is saying that don't do the maintenance or do the maintenance, then what is the logic behind it? So by saying, uh, my, my idea is that we I want to communicate that it's important to include the explainability aspect once we are developing these machine learning models. It's not sufficient just to develop machine learning model and like stop here. Okay. Thank you. Are there any further questions? Please come forward. Um, Sahara. Yes. I I have a question on this uh, on this transfer uh, learning. Mm -hmm. um, can you can you translate that into the 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 sewer pipe um, measurements that that we do? You know a little bit uh, about the sewer pipe visual camera measurements. Yes, uh, but for sewer pipe we have videos. Is it? Yeah. I guess oh, we can. Okay. This was uh, the, oh, these were only pictures. Uh, no, it, it's it's always uh, it, it is possible even if it is uh, videos. Yeah. So it, it it is possible to to do that. The only difference here is that uh, for images, I'm aware that there is a very generic data set, this ImageNet that is used in transfer learning. For okay. videos, uh, I guess there are data set for that, but I'm not uh, sure that which one that is. But I am definitely sure that we could uh, apply transfer learning for videos as well. And how would that work then? What, what would the procedure be to, to implement that and, and make use of it? I guess uh, the general uh, idea is that instead of actually um, analyzing these uh, videos uh, by experts to see that where are the damages and uh, what are the possible defects that you see in a video, uh, you could actually use a machine learning model which can tell us specifically that uh, what sort of damages are uh, there. So using these uh, bounding boxes, for example, or some segmentation, yeah. uh, so it can be useful in that way. But okay, for that, that, of course, we need videos first to give to our model and get it to, for the training purposes. Okay, and what and what would now then the transfer learning part be? So uh, in transfer learning, uh, the idea here is that instead of uh, so when we we train a neural network, neural network try to learn a very generic representation. So only then it is able to recognize that what sort of damages uh, it sees. Or if we take the example of day to day, for example, uh, say we make our neural network to detect if if in the image there is a picture and if, it, if there is a chair and if there is a chair where it is. So yeah. the neural network try to learn very generic representation. What happened in transfer learning is that instead of training only on the data set that we have, 
And here the idea is that the data set that we have for a specific problem are very small. So maybe we end up having say 10,000 images, but as we know that for machine learning models, the more the better. So with transfer learning, the idea is that how we could actually use the data set that is maybe not for uh, only consisting of chairs, but consist of uh, general things like day-to-day uh, -day objects other than chairs. We use this learned generic representation and then adapt it specifically to train the model that would only detect chairs, for example. So here in, in our problem, we use the ImageNet data set for this. So ImageNet data is uh, data set is very, is a big data set that has day-to-day -day object and it does not have anything to related to do the visual inspection of the bridges. So it did not have any dead, uh, oh. images for damage detection, but still we managed to uh, use it. And then we try to fine tune it for specific task. Okay. So okay. Yeah, th okay. there's the idea. Yeah, okay, thanks. Okay. So actually, um, Sarah, I kind of related question. So, um, so, so now you, I mean, I think we discussed this before to some extent. So what you, um, you say transfer learning, you think of image recognition, right? You think of classifiers. But if you think, think of predictive maintenance, um, classifiers are just a means to make some maintenance decisions. And um, of course, um, in your uh, more like deep learning approaches, what you actually want to do is you um, have more of a control problem, which is finding uh, the optimal maintenance plan. Mm -hmm. Do you, um, it's probably a bit far-fetched, but do you see transfer learning also um, going to these control problems? I've looked a bit into the literature, never found anything. I, I guess this is a very much open area of research. I means there are researches, I, there are research that are, uh, there are research that is looking into this, that how we could actually train, for example, uh, going into the reinforcement learning direction, that how we could actually train an agent uh, to learn these uh, general tasks and adapt it to our specific uh, task. So this, mm -hmm. there is research on it going. I mean, I can imagine if um, scenarios share certain features, then this is uh, kind of obvious that it's somehow possible. Yeah. Um, but if it's if it's really like what you call cross domain, then I, I could imagine that this is a very uh, far fetched. Uh, Even question. if it is for in domain, I guess the, uh, in that sense it is really very very hard because in images we see it's, it's sort of a static environment, but once we talk about this agent uh, mm -hmm. and this reinforcement uh, problem. Domain is just more of a dynamic environment, means there are a lot more trajectories that are going on as compared to just if we compare it with the images. So I think yeah. it's it's very complicated. Yeah, yeah. Um, are there any other questions? Because I, I have actually one more, but I wouldn't. Here's a question. Um, I've seen a project where correct detection plays a role, but each does its own thing to train a model with different results should build on the results of previous studies. How could that be done? Such is a thing I was wondering about because uh, you see that, that we all make our own training sets and uh, uh, try to build on that. But uh, uh, actually the idea would, if, if we would be able to build on, to, on each other's work, that would be better because uh, each one, everyone does a little bit of the training, but how could you set up a network where this could be done? Because I think that more or less fits into your ideas, but yeah. I would wonder how how could we do that? Because I see everyone doing it over and over again. <laughs> yeah, yes. I guess this is exactly what transfer learning suggests to do, that instead of learning on our small uh, data set, how we could actually say uh, set uh, uh, training, uh, how we could use a bigger uh, uh, data set for it. So for example, maybe if there is a, a say there are already a models that are good in crack detection, but they are not good at detection of say exposed bar. So we could use that model already and train it further for the images that are having a training images of say Korean stain or exposed uh, uh, bars or concrete bars. And then this model is already able to detect much more uh, sort of uh, defects or damages. Actually, this, this can be, done uh, very well, either using transfer learning or using uh, the, 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 the data set that we are talking about here for crack detection and extending them for the, to, to make them applicable to more, much more uh, damages type. 
that would be take some sort of uh, open sharing of uh, of both data and uh, and uh, and training sets. Uh, so if, if we don't want to, for example, if we don't want to share the data because of uh, uh, the, the reasons, if we only share our models, uh, even then that can be done. So in model, we can share the pre-trained weights and that can already be done. So for example, in this transfer learning part, what we did, uh, we did not actually have the ImageNet data because ImageNet data is so big and it is hard to actually retrain our architectures on such a big data set. We could uh, use already... Uh, the model that is trained on ImageNet and use that model for further adaptation. So even if we don't have access to the data set, that's, that's already possible. Okay. But we need access to the models, the trained models, of course. Can I have one question? Please, please. Um, so suppose we would have a such a, a set of models from a general, more general or complete set of data, different data sets. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe as a follow up of the question of uh, Hanno, um, what part of these models would you then uh, choose to, to to tune on your particular problem? Would that be the, is, is it working with neural networks where you train all, all the weights or do you take part of the model? So I try to imagine a little bit how to adapt these models to the particular job, so to say. Or are there specific methods for that? Or I, I guess there are different uh, strategies uh, for that. So, for example, if you talk in a sense of neural network and we are using some training set, then we can apply different strategies. So it could be a complete fine tuning of a, a network. It could be only a few fine tuning of the few layers of fine tuning, means keeping the some layers frozen and the other layers we find even for our specific downstream task. So means it, it depends like what sort of uh, uh, representations are much more generic for our specific uh, downstream task. I see. And are there criteria to select which part or which way to go, which procedure um, to take? I or guess, is it just trial and error? Yeah, I guess m for most of the things in machine learning, once we are trying to adapt our model for a specific downstream task, it's, it's more of like uh, hyper parameters tuning. We change different parameters and see that how model is doing. And if it is doing better, we say that uh, this is the hit and this is the right way to go. So we're doing a lot of optimization to find the global optimum, so to say. That's in fact what you do. Yeah, yeah. There are so, different uh, approaches to do that. So there are, are different grid search and that you can apply to come up with the most optimal parameters. Thank you. Yeah. OK, any more questions? That seems not to be the case. Then, um, Sarah, thanks again for this very nice talk and the nice discussion um, for everybody. So um, thanks for attending. And um, the next colloquium will be in uh, two weeks by um, Isa Sena Erugus on maintenance optimization for multi-component systems with a single sensor. And um, she will present her work there. And we're very excited to have her. So um, thanks, everybody. And um, goodbye. Have a nice evening. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Have a nice evening. Goodbye. And thanks for the presentation.